Good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, depending when you're joining us from today. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today, we're very pleased to bring you our second installment of the E4C seminar series. This series is spearheaded by SME's Engineering for Global Development Research Committee, and its purpose is to intellectually develop the field of engineering for global development. Each month, we are hosting a new research institution to learn about their work advancing the United Nation Sustainable Development Goals. So with that, my name is Jana Aranda. I'm the president of Engineering for Change, and I'll be serving as one of the moderators for today's seminar. The seminar you're participating in today will be archived on the E4C webinars page, as well as on our YouTube channel. Both of those URLs are listed on this slide. Information on upcoming seminars is available on the same page and E4C members will receive invitations to upcoming seminars directly. If you have any questions, comments, and recommendations for future topics and speakers, please contact the E4C team at research at engineeringforchange.org. If you're following us on Twitter today, I'd like to invite you to join us in the conversation with our dedicated hashtag, hashtag E4C seminar series. Now, before we move on to our presenters, I'd like to tell you a bit about E4C. E4C is a knowledge organization, digital platform, and global community of more than 1 million engineers, designers, development practitioners, and social scientists who are leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities around the globe. Some of those challenges may include access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy solutions, improved agriculture, and more. We invite you to become a member E4C membership is free and provides access to news and thought leaders, insights of hundreds of essential technologies in our solutions library, professional development resources, and current opportunities such as jobs, funding calls, fellowships, and more. E4C members also receive exclusive invitations to online and regional events and access to resources aligned to their interests. We invite you to visit our website, engineeringforchange.org, to learn more and sign up. E4C's research work cuts across geographies and sectors to deliver an ecosystem view of technology for good. Original research is conducted by E4C fellows annually on behalf of our partners and clients and delivered as digestible reports with implementable insights. We invite you to visit our research page, the URL is again listed on the slide, to explore, explore our trend analysis, research collaborations, and review of the state of the engineering, uh, a state of engineering for global development a compilation of academic programs and institutions offering training in the sector. If you have research questions or want to work with us on a research project as a research fellow, please contact us at research at engineeringforchange.org. For those of you who are interested in launching an Engineering for Global Development course in your institution, we invite you to check out the Engineering for Change Educational Toolkit. This is a free open source syllabus of a freshman course developed in partnership with Lipscomb University's Raymond B. Jones College of Engineering. If you have recommendations for other resources that we can develop and deliver, we also encourage you to contact us. All right. So with that, uh, we wanted to take care of some housekeeping items. Uh, let's go ahead and take a moment to practice using the WebEx platform. I invite you to right now use the chat window uh, to let us know where you're joining us from today. Now the chat window, if you don't see it, is located at the bottom right of your screen. And you can just type in your location right there. I see some folks already doing this. So we are now also join you guys in this exercise. All right, so we have oh, someone from Canada, from my home, uh, from home country, Vermont, Brooklyn, New York. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Uh, again, if you don't see the chat window, uh, look for the icon that is in the middle of the slides at the bottom of the screen. Just as a note, so we'd like you to use the Q&A window, which is located below the chat, to type in your questions to the presenter. Again, if you don't see the Q&A window, just look for the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen in the middle of the slides. All right, so welcome folks from Michigan, from Stockholm, from Pennsylvania, and some more from Ontario. Welcome, Canada. So glad to see you. I'm a bit partial. 
All right, and with that, I'd like to uh, go ahead and introduce our presenter and our moderator for today. Uh, Dr. Kondra Mehta is, is the inaugural Vice Provost for Creative Inquiry and the Director of the Mountaintop Initiative at Lehigh University. Uh, Mehta champions the creation of learning environments and ecosystems where students, faculty, and external partners come together to increase their capabilities for independent inquiry, take intellectual risks, and learn from failure, recognize problems and opportunities, and effect constructive and sustainable change. Previously, Mehta was the founding director of the Humanitarian Engineering and Social Entrepreneurship, or HESC, program at Penn State University. He serves as an associate editor of the IEEE Technology and Society magazine and contributing editor for Engineering for Change. His latest book, Solving Problems That Matter and Getting Paid for It, is very critical, takes a deep dive into STEM careers in social innovation and global sustainable development. He is, um, all right, so I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna read through the whole bio because you're gonna learn quite a bit about Kanjan in today's presentation. Uh, and with that, I just also want to introduce our moderator and uh, one of the architects of the series, Dr. Jesse Austin Brennerman, who is an assistant professor of mechanical engineering at the University of Michigan. He earned his PhD in mechanical engineering in 2014 from MIT. He also holds yeah. a SM. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, I don't think we, I think we should just get right to the stuff, you know, I mean, I'm we'll very excited right. to, to get to Kanjan. I'm going to be here to help All moderate right. questions and talk and, and help with the discussion afterwards. But uh, yeah, very excited right. to have all of you here. Thanks, Yana. All right. No worries. I'm, I'm so enthusiastic about your bio, but I will, be, <laughs> will shorten it from here and uh, get over control to Kanjan right now so he can go ahead and uh, present his slides and mute myself uh, to avoid further bio reading. <laughs> Over to awesome. you, Kanjan. So, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for the kind introduction. Jesse, thanks uh, for having me. Jana, thanks for all your work in the background there. I'm going to spend the next uh, 30, 35 minutes talking about uh, some of our work to the Global Social Impact Fellowship at Lehigh. And uh, then I, I hope to have uh, at least 10, 15 minutes uh, for questions and answers. So I'm at Lehigh University, which is in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Uh, we're about an hour from Philadelphia, about an hour and a half from uh, New York City. Uh, we have about 5,000 undergraduates, uh, undergrad students growing to 6,000 over the next few years, uh, about 2,300 grad students. So we are a mid-sized research university. and. Um, and uh, over the next uh, 30 minutes or so, I'm going to give you a quick backdrop of why we do what we do, talk about some of the ventures in the Global Social Impact Fellowship, uh, talk about academic model, uh, talk just a little bit about venture and fieldwork funding because I always get a question from other academics on how we do these kinds of things, and a little bit about uh, practical partnerships and then try to, uh, try to zoom out and talk about some of the larger lessons learned. Uh, so. We believe uh, very strongly in preparing students to live a life of impact, and that is impact in terms of how they help uh, improve the human condition over their 40 year or so uh, in a working life, uh, and how it connects to them as individuals. So that impact on themselves and helping them find their ikigai, find their reason for being, is just as important for us. And this is about finding that intersection between what, uh, what you love what the world needs, what you're good at, and what you can be paid for. In other words, finding this intersection between passion, mission, profession, and vocation, uh, which a lot of our students are looking for when they embark on a college education. It's about that deep sense of purpose. Um, and, and experiences such as the Global Social Impact Fellowship help, help find that sense of purpose. We also believe very strongly in um, this, this life of uh, impact being uh, being uh, built on the foundations of skill sets, mindsets, and portfolios. And uh, we believe in a mindset-led education because if you can believe it, if you can think it, you can learn it, and you can do it. So those mindsets are just as important as the skill sets, and ultimately the proof is in the pudding. And we want our students to develop strong portfolios of accomplishment as they go through their education. And this sum of skill sets, mindsets, and portfolios helps our students develop a new identity, develop their agency and self-efficacy, uh, reach a higher level of consciousness, and um, as I said earlier, find their sense of purpose and belonging in the world. Uh, so when we talk of skill sets, uh, it is about teamwork and communication, and then the World Economic Forum 2020 skill sets 
such as complex problem solving and critical thinking and creativity and coordinating and emotional intelligence and so on. Uh, when we think of mindsets, it's things like design thinking, but not just design thinking where they become experts at post-it notes, uh, but also entrepreneurial thinking and systems thinking and seeing, being able to see the forest and the trees, a data-driven approach, an evidence-based approach, um, ethical decision-making, which is incredibly important uh, no matter what we do, uh, taking the lead and playing by strengths, and most important, the one that is closest to my heart is about execution, it's about getting stuff done. You know, ideas don't solve problems. We want, to, we want our students to get really good at taking ideas, identifying opportunities, and advancing them through the long, winded path towards measurable, sustainable impact, getting stuff done. And finally, when it comes to portfolios, uh, we are really interested not just in, uh, as students engage in these kinds of experiences, we want them to not just think about personal growth, which is wonderful, but also the professional recognition that they get from other external entities and how exactly do they contribute to advancing knowledge and advancing practice. And the point here is that while personal growth is internally calibrated, uh, the other three areas of advancing practice, knowledge, and professional recognition are externally calibrated, and we want them to go out and get that external validation and boost their portfolios and prepare them for a, world, for a life of impact. So how do we do that? We believe that it happens through real, meaningful, authentic projects. Uh, my office runs a number of programs that span the university and that bring together students and faculty from each of our colleges. And uh, we do a lot of this work through, uh, through a summer program called the Mount of Summer Experience where we pay students to work on all kinds of open-ended interdisciplinary problems. And every single team then continues that work into the academic year through a, through a set of creative inquiry courses. So we don't invest in one semester, two semester projects. We are interested in moonshots. We are interested in three to five year long or even longer ambitious projects that can really move the needle on a really compelling topic. Uh, so we have teams that have been working on 3D printed concrete and uh, a team that is looking at um, uh, and actually, yeah, they've developed a performance that they are now doing across the region to educate people about, um, about mass incarceration through social theater. We have teams that are trying to understand the relationship between creativity and anxiety at the genetic level. We have teams that are, uh, that are developing a VR tour for the Lehigh Valley watershed for our local middle school so that kids who are not able to travel can still understand and appreciate uh, the watershed. So it's, we have about 30 or so projects in this whole ecosystem that are all focused on impact in the longer term. Uh, we have teams that are working on low-cost parklets. Uh, they're focused on tactile urbanism to make our downtown area, uh, which is um, which is an economically disadvantaged region, more kind of attractive to small businesses and more walkable and more inviting. So it's a really wide portfolio of projects, and about 11 of them are part of um, the Global Social Impact Fellowship, which, as the name says, is all about global social impact. So I'm going to quickly run you through uh, what some of these ventures look like, and then we'll try to kind of zoom out and see and, you know, try to talk about what kinds of projects we find exciting and why. So we have a team that is working on a $2 diagnostic device for sickle cell trait. Uh, West Africa, 24% of uh, the population has sickle cell trait and the diagnostic devices that they have right now uh, are incredibly expensive and, and hence inaccessible. And uh, so this is a $2 test strip. We are actually moving pretty close towards clinical trials um, this summer. Uh, we have a team that is working on mushroom production systems to support circular agriculture where the outputs of rice farming, the rice husk, can be used to grow mushrooms. Uh, we started in Cambodia where uh, with our nonprofit partner, World Hope International, uh, we're now doing about 6,000 kilos of mushroom cultivation on a weekly basis. So last year we did about $800,000 in sales of these mushrooms that is now being kind of pumped back into the social enterprise to get more farmers up and running with mushroom cultivation. And now we are trying to do exactly the same um, in, in Sierra Leone. A very different ecosystem and an incredibly uh, complex technical challenge. Uh, believe it or not, growing mushrooms is not that easy, but once you get it, there's tremendous potential for profit and uh, value creation, especially for women. 
Uh, one of our flagship ventures is a test strip to screen women for urinary tract infections and preeclampsia. The test strips that are used in Sierra Leone right now cost about $2 each, and um, uh, that's not affordable. Sierra Leone has the highest maternal mortality rates in the world, and so this is a two-cent test strip uh, to screen women for UTIs and preeclampsia, as I said, sorry. Um, so here, uh, the picture on the left here is Cassidy Dross, one of my awesome students who graduated in December. And uh, about two years back, she was the one who worked in the wet lab developing the test strip, uh, along with a team of uh, students from every college. And then that team uh, just got regulatory approval for this device in November of last year and hired their first employees starting the 1st of December. So Cassidy was able to take this test strip from understanding the challenge, developing the product, negotiating with our vendor in China, developing the distribution pathways, um, we actually got a grant from Grand Challenges Canada, so thank you, Canada, uh, for, for to, to study the distribution channels to get this test strip out to the women who need it most who can get tested in the comfort and privacy of their homes. And uh, here is Nakesh Gomani, who's been working on this team for uh, the last two years, who's going to be graduating in May and moving to Sierra Leone uh, for a year to work with our staff on the ground to get this test strip to three of the major districts with a population of over 3 million women. So it's about scale, and it's about building systems to enable that. Um, we have a team that's working on a documentary on safe motherhood and trying to shine the light on some of the, the innovations that are happening in Sierra Leone to celebrate them and to make others in the country aware of them and, um, and use that to educate people and, uh, and increase you know, awareness and understanding of maternal health issues. Uh, we actually have a bunch of uh, students that are working on um, uh, shelf-stable aspirational food products that can deliver micronutrients, such as vitamin A and zinc and iodine, uh, to kids, because 40% of the kids under the age of five are stunted. Uh, so we have a recipe. We did taste testing with uh, over 400 mothers and kids last summer, and uh, we're actually just about to, uh, to actually launch the venture on a full-time basis. Um, we have a team that's working on community-scale plastics recycling. Uh, they, they've been working in the Philippines with um, the University of the Philippines, and they've basically got a bunch of machines that can take plastic waste and convert them into, uh, into all kinds of products. They have a first customer with a local restaurant group, and uh, they are, they're working with uh, other nonprofits and trying to position that as a business in a box that entrepreneurs can take to convert uh, waste into plastic. Um, we have a team that's looking at uh, diagnosing autism in a context and culturally appropriate manner in West Africa. Another enormous challenge, lots of stigma, and uh, almost no services, and uh, little understanding and uh, awareness of the issue, uh, no diagnosis methods. So that's where we're trying to develop uh, this tool, uh, working closely with the health ministry and other nonprofits. Uh, Philippines, you know, we're looking at birthing practices, again, uh, trying to you know, improve uh, uh, maternal health. Uh, looking at copra value chains and coconut processing that, uh, that engages over 3.5 million farmers in um, Philippines alone and trying to make the supply chains more, the value chains more efficient and design uh, products to increase the shelf life of coconut products. And this is actually, most of the students on this team are material science students who are looking at this from a materials perspective, much more so than a process perspective. Uh, there are teams in Kazakhstan working on air, po air pollution issues. So we have a team working on smart city innovations, uh, especially as um, the cities keep growing and urban migration, which is a reality. How do you build the city to work for some of the new uh, entrants into the city? Uh, so this is in Kazakhstan. So it's a pretty wide portfolio of ventures, and uh, we, you know, we keep growing. We're looking at a bunch of new ventures uh, in Madagascar um, and uh, Hong Kong and other parts of the world. So here's the deal. Across the board, here are some of the common project characteristics. Uh, the first is uh, longer time horizons. Uh, you cannot do any of this work in a semester or two. It takes a long time. And so all we, everything we do, they are multi-year ventures. We're not interested in summer romances. We build relationships and the projects emerge from those relationships. Uh, it's all about evidence-based approaches, and so we have rigorous research expectations. I think every single team over the last year published at least one article 
and we expect every student, every single student that is in the fellowship where they make a one-year commitment, at the end of which they pass the baton on to the next team, to have at least one publication. Uh, realities of a university, ultimately we are a university, and that's where we have a number of practical partnerships. So as these, uh, as these innovations of many different types emerge, we have pathways to scale them up. Um, these ventures have high resource needs. Uh, so the seed funding can come from the university. That's the first $500. That's the first $1,000. But then we expect them to go out and get funding uh, to advance the project forward. Um, there's no, none, of, none of these projects are working on a single product or service. It's an entire ensemble. You have to design the entire system. So we are incredibly focused on systemic innovation and entrepreneurship. And uh, so here's an example of uh, one of our, one of our um, uh, ventures with Roly test strips, uh, which I talked about earlier. And if you look at this kind of set of concentric squares, number one is our box of test strips, all right? Uh, that we spent three years or probably longer than that developing that, getting it through regulatory approval. But along with that, we designed 35 other artifacts. Everything from the training regimen to get health workers to be able to use this product, to data collection and monitoring systems to make our systems better, but also to collect data on how many women are we actually screening. Are they ultimately getting the treat treatment they need? So we're trying to go from like end to end and make sure that we are actually not just selling test strips, but we are actually saving lives, right? So you have to design that entire ensemble with, uh, with a lot of different things. And that's where you need a, a, a deep systems approach. So this is about sustainable, scalable impact. The focus is on markets and systems. The focus is absolutely not on people or communities, but of course, systems are made of markets, are made of communities, are made of people. But we are interested at the systems level and not kind of at the people level or the communities level. Uh, so we would be very kind of skeptical of uh, using the S word, the service word. This is not about service. This is about social enterprise and systems innovation. Um, a lot of these ventures require large investments of time, money, energy, and so we actually take a good bit of time to even identify uh, what areas, what uh, projects we will pick up. Uh, it is, we just don't pick up any project. It's often six to nine months, sometimes longer, before we even make a project open to students and bring them in. So there's a lot of work that goes into finding these projects. Uh, very high expectations from students. We have three goals, impact, impact, and impact. That's all that matters. Uh, the impact on the ground comes first in terms of building independent, uh, independent self-sustaining systems. The second goal would be research and publication and, uh, and not to fill a gap in the literature as much as um, democratizing knowledge, as much as inspiring and um, and, uh, and supporting other innovators working on other similar grand challenges, such as plastics recycling or maternal health or what have you. So, and then the third goal is after doing all of this, if the students learn something, wonderful, right? Good for them. But the idea here is very simple. If you set out to learn, you'll learn. If you set out to really create something systemically that does not exist, you're gonna learn so much more doing that. Um, so very select students and even more select faculty. So we spend a lot of time trying to find the right faculty and prep them uh, and support them as they're working on these kinds of, uh, of uh, ambitious projects. Uh, in terms of the academic model, uh, students apply to be a part of the fellowship. It's a one-year program. They apply in the fall semester. About we, we've been accepting about half the students. Uh, they sign up for three credits in the spring semester, three in the fall semester of which one third is a common workshop class for all the students across all the projects where we equip them with the skill sets and toolkits and uh, mindsets that they need to be successful with their projects. Uh, we have several uh, full day retreats and workshops on fieldwork preparation, on research writing, um, on understanding the context, on, on making better observations. It's a pretty wide array of topics. So seminars are actually three hours a week. You know, it's pretty intense. Um, and then students can do a mountaintop summer experience over the summer where they actually get paid a stipend to work on the project on a full-time basis for about eight to 10 weeks and accelerate the project. And then they engage in two to three weeks of field work in country with our local partners and for a number of ventures for our employees that have been hired under the legal organization of our partners 
but work very closely with our team here uh, in terms of the intellectual leadership for the venture. Um, and then they'll travel out to conferences and we expect them to you know, talk about their work. Uh, so, you know, things like the ASME Impact Engineer Conference, a great learning opportunity for them. The Global Humanitarian Technology Conference, an excellent learning opportunity, and we expect all teams to have at least one article. As long as they're working on technology stuff, but not all teams are, right? We have teams working on all kinds of things. And uh, given where I sit, frankly, I don't care whether I love engineering, but I don't care if something is, has technology or not. I want to see the impact. And uh, let's be realistic on, on how we will get there. Uh, these are some of the topics for kind of the spring semester class. I don't want to get into the details, but it's a really wide array of topics that we spend a lot of time studying. What do students really need to be successful with their ventures? And that's how these topics are identified and then delivered with a lot of, uh, uh, with a lot of active pedagogies. And uh, it's all about, all about the project. You learn something, good for you. That's how we approach this. Um, and then, uh, you know, the field work in country, uh, pretty intense again. Uh, we'll have, uh, for example, we had 22 students in Sierra Leone, and we had eight faculty that were working with them shoulder to shoulder and working with about 25, 30 people on the ground that are partnering with us on all these different uh, ventures. Um, the fall class, there's one thing I wanted to point out was that there are three themes. Uh, one is ethical decision making, which is something that we have a significant emphasis on because uh, it's just incredibly important when you're working in this space. So no matter what our students choose to do, we want them to be able to make good, sound, ethical decisions and make that part of you know, every thought and every action. Uh, so we, we drive that. We drive grassroots diplomacy, which is about how do you get stuff done in a radically different cultural context in a harmonious manner. And uh, then we have a significant emphasis on uh, systems thinking and strategy and conceptual frameworks and, uh, and, and, and uh, so on. Um, so in terms of demographics, uh, we have uh, 54 students in this program, uh, pretty even mix between arts and sciences and engineering with some students from business, uh, some graduate students from education. The students are overwhelmingly uh, undergraduate students, 90% are undergrads. Again, a pretty good mix between um, uh, juniors, seniors, sophomores, and a few freshmen. Uh, so this is where we have freshmen and third or fourth year PhD students uh, who are all kind of coming together, being a part of this team, and advancing the venture forward. Uh, in terms of gender, significant, um, uh, significantly more women than men. Uh, if you look at ethnicity, we actually have an incredibly, incredibly diverse group of students uh, of 54 students, uh, 25 are white, non-Hispanic, but we have a good mix of Asian American, multiracial, multi Hispanic, and African American students. And finally, 24 of our 54 students are first generation. Um, and that's very important to us as a university, and we are delighted that we've been able to, uh, to uh, you know, engage them in these kinds of ambitious multi-year projects. All right. So how does funding work? Um, uh, you know, the in-country expenses are covered by my office. Uh, it comes to about $1,000 per student, and we have, um, we have a few donors and uh, it's, uh, a few grants that cover it. And then uh, the students are responsible for their airfare, visas, and other things. So it comes to about $1,500 to $2,000. And we have various um, uh, research centers and colleges chip in, especially to cover uh, the high-need students which is a pretty significant number of the students who are part of this program have high financial needs. So we've been very proactive in ensuring that, uh, that not having those finances is not a barrier uh, to engagement. Um, venture funding, we get funding from a lot of different sources. Uh, VentureWell has funded a number of our programs. Uh, we actually just got an NSF uh, career grant, which where a significant emphasis is on some of our work in the Philippines. We have you know, a couple other NSF grants pending. EPA P3, we just got a new Central Asia University Partnerships Grant to support our work in Kazakhstan. Uh, so it's a pretty wide array, and our students are always working on, uh, on new uh, proposals. Uh, so we tell students why. It's pretty important for us to get the right students, and uh, this is how we, uh, we, we um, uh, you know, support. Uh, this is how we kind of frame our, our projects and uh, you know, tell students whether or not they should do this. Um, 
you know, first is that this is not about just learning about it. This is about doing social impact. Uh, very real ventures, real people, real impact. We're not. So first of all, this is big debate on do you design with and design for. And I don't want to get into the semantics of it, but the kinds of products we work on are seldom things that we can have direct engagement from students or from community folks uh, or in the, even in the healthcare system. So while they might not while they might not be a part of the design team, they're absolutely part of the larger systems design team. So we work very, very closely uh, with governments and, uh, and uh, nonprofits and UN agencies. And a lot of the requests, like the nutrition project, that was a request from the National Director for Nutrition uh, in Sierra Leone who said, hey, this is a real challenge and uh, we don't have the expertise in this and can you, is this something you can help us with? And then we looked and we found the right uh, faculty who had expertise and we you know, worked on that project further. And that is something we really try to get our students to understand. Uh, it's about travel, culture, developing life skills, uh, learning how, to, uh, how 20 people can fit into a single vehicle. It's a great life skill. Uh, working in multidisciplinary teams, all our teams are incredibly uh, multidisciplinary. Um, becoming a global professional, so this is actually Hassan Koroma, who's one of our first uh, employees for the test trip project, and we are negotiating a contract with him uh, in this, in this uh, project, uh, in this photo. Uh, an emphasis on scholarly research and publication, uh, traveling to conferences and presenting your work. Uh, undergraduate conferences don't count. They have to play with the big boys and girls and uh, go through the peer review process and you know, do rigorous work. Um, this is a great for, way for them to distinguish themselves. A lot of the students are looking at med schools and Fulbrights and PhD programs, and uh, this really helps them uh, set themselves apart as they're applying to their dream schools. Uh, a lot of our students actually pursue in fact, focused careers. Uh, we have students working everything from the State Department to major foundations to their started social enterprises and preparing students for those kinds of folk, uh, careers focused on social impact is pretty important to us. Um, and finally, it's also about fun uh, and lifelong friendships that you cultivate when you worked on something together 20 hours a week, 24 uh, seven in the field for two years. Um, but most importantly, it is about the three goals. It's about the impact, it's about the impact, and it's about the impact. Um, and, you know, that, that piece of paper that, you know, that's actually our uh, regulatory approval for, the, for our test trips, that's a magical document because all the students that were part of making this happen um, would be, you know, that's a game changer for them personally and for, for the venture as a whole. Um, so here's, you know, fundamentally to kind of summarize the next, next couple of minutes, uh, here's what we believe and some of the lessons learned. First of all, we absolutely take for granted interdisciplinary engagement, 24-7 nonstop action and radical ownership in these ventures. Uh, first, do then learn because then you learn why you need to learn something. So it's, it's really hands-on. Let's do stuff and then go and take a class in organic chemistry or fluid mechanics or whatever we need to make this device work. Uh, it's, about, it's not about problems, it's about opportunities, and we're always we going with an opportunity mindset, with an entrepreneurial mindset. Uh, it's not about activities, it's about outcomes. Uh, it's not about heroes, we don't want to be heroes. Our goal actually is self of solacence. Uh, we want get stuff doneers. So to give you a quick example, one of our most successful venture across the world in my previous life was low-cost greenhouses, and now we have eight companies that manufacture and sell these greenhouses. But, you know, we don't own any of it. We help, we work with a lot of partners. We help them get, it, help them get, it, help them get it started. They run it. You know, it's, it's their venture, and uh, we are out of it. So self obsolescence is a goal across a lot of these ventures but bringing together our knowledge and their knowledge to fuse it to create sustainable value, right? So it's about getting stuff done. Uh, it's not about product, it's about ecosystems. I talked about the ensemble. You know, you can't just design one product, you have to design or co-create co the whole system. Uh, we don't want volunteers, we don't take volunteers, we want our students to come in as professionals that deliver. Uh, we need convergence of concepts, cultures, disciplines, epistemologies to make this happen. Um, it's not about one-offs, it's about scalable solutions. Life is short, why do we focus on one-offs? 
uh, we are not interested as, or we're not as excited about, uh, about communities as much as we are about markets, because that's where we are expanding choice for people, and people can always, uh, you know, grow vegetables the way they always have, or try using one of our greenhouses for which will help them get access to capital and double, triple their income. People can choose not to get screened for UTIs, or we can educate them on why they should get screened and how that can help save their baby's life. And, you know, that education is transformative because no pregnant woman is, you know, not going to get tested if their child's or their baby's life is in jeopardy, right? So it's about, you know, embracing markets and building scalable systems. Passion is good, but, you know, passion doesn't solve problems. You need rigor. You need evidence. Um, ideation, it all starts with an idea, but we really focus on execution. Uh, the, the technology product, the idea is 1%. The other 99% is, is accountability structures, business models, um, uh, you know, finding the right talent uh, and making stuff happen, right? So it's about building those systems. So we really emphasize execution. Uh, we're not interested in episodic engagement. We're more excited about longer term engagement in some of these places, uh, to, in all these places uh, to ensure that we have those long-term impacts. It's not about jobs, it's about careers. Um, but most importantly, it's about going into this space for the right reasons. And uh, that is something we stress with uh, all our partners. And, uh, you know, the question is, why do we do what we do? And there are many different philosophies. You can, you know, go in with a, with a kind of personal development mindset. Uh, you can go in with a view to save people. Geez, that's pretty scary. But, you know, but that's what drives some people. Uh, so there are a lot of, there are as many philosophies as there are people and for me personally, it's about uh, the Ubuntu philosophy of I am because we are, and we are in this world together. And the question is, we have certain, uh, you know, education, skill sets, mindsets, and how do we fuse it with what a lot of our partners have to improve quality of life for everybody. Um, and the best way, and this is my last slide, is, um, is uh, my favorite philosophy comes from Dr. V, uh, Dr. Arvind Venkatswami, the founder of the Arvind Eye Hospital, who talked about how when we grow in spiritual consciousness, we identify ourselves with all that is in the world, and there is no exploitation because it is ourselves we are helping and it is ourselves we are healing. So that would be kind of the philosophical framework to which we approach this work, and uh, that is something we, you know, start with when we engage new students and faculty, but then it ends, it always ends in three words, get stuff done. And on that note, I will open it up for questions, comments, and exodus. Uh, uh, all right, well, thank you very much, uh, Kanjan. Thank you very much for uh, that, that great talk and overview of the work you guys are doing at Lehigh. I think, uh, obviously, you ran very quickly through all the projects, but I really liked how you summarized sort of hey, these are, these are the characteristics of the types of projects we are trying to do. And I think, uh, you know, in seeing a lot of the, the question and answers that people are, are posting, I think, Yana, you're going to help me with this. But a lot of this is about sort of how are you changing the objective of a university engagement with these types of projects, right? So I think a lot of it, a lot of the questions we're having to do with, hey, we've seen all these failures where people don't address systemic issues. And what I took away, what resonated with, with me from your, from your presentation was really this difference between, hey, we want students to learn, we're going to send you over, we're going to do the student project to, hey, we really just care about impact. And if we care about impact, we'll learn along the way, right? And our students will benefit along the way. So the primary goal is that impact, and to do that, we need projects that, or you have found, that you need projects that have these characteristics, right? And yep. so that's when you're looking at the system level. So I think a lot of the examples that uh, Len McKnight was talking about were, were talking about, like, these sort of not understanding system level interactions. So maybe you understand the end user, but you don't understand something that, that's, that's going to prevent impact. I think maybe could you talk a little bit about how you guys define and measure impact? I know it's different for every project, but when you say, hey, our objective is impact, what does that mean to you? Sure. So, um, 
So how we how exactly we measure it really depends on the project, and frankly, it also depends on the kind of resources we have to do the impact assessment because measuring impact is not cheap. It actually costs a lot of money to do it right. Uh, so to give an example, uh, you know, with this greenhouse project that we wrapped up two years back, our primary goal ultimately was to create an independent, okay, let's, everybody, independent, self-sustaining social enterprise run by, run by folks in Sierra Leone that manufacture and sell these greenhouses to farmers and educate them on how to transition from open-air farming to greenhouse farming to improve their income, to improve food security, and to uh, fight climate change stressors, okay? That was the goal. That's exactly what we've now been able to accomplish. And so when, during the first three years when USAID uh, was funding this, we were actually looking at indicators like uh, how many greenhouses are we building, which is a good short-term output, not an outcome. Uh, but then as we transitioned from year one to year two and three, we said, okay, for how many of these greenhouses have the farmers recovered their capital investments, which can only happen if they're actually successful in using these to grow more vegetables, sell them, and make it, uh, you know, economically feasible, right? Where is the, where are the vegetables that they are growing going? Are they just selling all of them? Is this supporting their own families and neighbors' nutritional needs? So it was actually a pretty you know, and we, the other dimension to this was water savings because a lot of our work, uh, well, funding came from um, uh, securing water for food that was about securing water for food. So we had a whole bunch of measures on tracking water usage. And we were able to demonstrate how we can now grow uh, vegetables. We can grow, grow three to 10 times as many vegetables uh, at, uh, uh, you know, with 30 to 70%, with 30 to 70% less water. Uh, so those were it's pretty wide-ranging, um, uh, you know, measurement evaluation system. But ultimately, the impact there was in Sierra Leone alone, we have um, uh, over 100 greenhouses that have, you know, stood the test of time that are being used and that have contributed to local food security, and the folks who run it have uh, significantly improved their own and their employees' quality of life. And if I look at the venture across the board, we have more than 1,000 uh, greenhouses now uh, that have transformed the lives of uh, tens of thousands of farmers. You know, we have audited case studies done by USAID on a single farmer in Mozambique who with a $1,200 investment was able to make $100,000 more. Uh, and there was like clear how that money trickled down to their employees who got a 25% bonus and how it improved their quality of life. So if you have the funding, you can do that kind of deeper assessment. Um, that's a long-winded answer. If I can say one more thing, you know, you got to realize that when you're working with markets, when you're working with systems, there is no charity. There is nothing that we are, you know, giving away. There is no play for, there's no merry-go-round prompt which fails. You know, if that fails, we you know right away that it's failing. People are not buying your product. So we focus on products that people are willing to pay for, and then you get feedback very quickly whether it's working or it's not working. With my test strips, are people willing to pay two cents or actually it's more like 10 cents when they purchase it? Are they willing to pay 10 cents to get tested or not? We know right away if they don't pay. And then we know how many women that got screened also got diagnosed, right? So it's a whole, it's a different approach. And a lot of the conversations I hear about this space are about projects of the engineers without border types typically uh, that, that are focused on going and implementing stuff where people are not directly investing uh, in that product or service. And look, you need that in certain cases. I, I fully respect that, but that's not the kind of work we do. This is more market-centric. Yeah, 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 no, I can't hear you. That's because I muted myself on my phone and forgot. So sorry, thank you gentlemen for pointing out that I'm talking to myself. So, uh, Kamdan, just um, pulling on that thread a little bit, and uh, we've seen uh, the, the approach of uh, teaching uh, engineers development economics or, and, in this sector because of how important it is to understand uh, market-based solutions and, and integrate that. Um, in your uh, framework for the, the program, you went to it quite quickly, do you touch on development economics or do the students and staff learn about those principles through the, the projects themselves? 
uh, so through the common workshop class, we actually have a significant, significant well, not as much as I would like, but no, we, we, do, we probably have the classes focused on, uh, on development economics, but from an entrepreneurial perspective and not a political perspective, right? The politics is great. That's how about how the world ought to be. This is about how do we make change. And so, in fact, the very first class or the very first thing we do in the retreat is to look at different ways in which you can create change. The direct approaches, indirect approaches, we compare them, contrast them, and then we kind of say, okay, so what direction are we going in and how will this work? And then a significant emphasis on, on business models and uh, how to build, you know, ventures, how to build movements, and so on. Um, I want to follow up. There was a question from uh, Gustav Isaacson. Uh, I believe from Sweden, and then Glenn, and I actually wrote down the same question. Seems like the importance of the team, the relationships, and the partner identification is crucial throughout this multi-year thing. So you're saying like, it takes nine months before I even decide whether I wanna do this, right? Yeah. So can you talk to us about some of the ways or like strategies you use to think about who should be on this team and how do I identify those right partnerships when constructing these ventures? Because you need the local partners that you're talking about. That's your end goal. You know, you're building this all in, right? Yeah. So I think it all starts with the local partners and finding partners with a similar philosophy of engagement is absolutely critical. So I'm a very market-centric person, system-centric person, yeah. and I would not be I would not be a good partner for a nonprofit that is looking to get um, uh, students to go and uh, paint walls or looking to kind of build a structure. That's just not going to work, right? So finding partners that have that uh, have a similar philosophy of engagement, for me it's about uh, technology-based or non-tech, but market-based and systemic approaches, right? That mindset is critical. You build those partnerships, and then you just, as you spend more time on the ground, uh, all kinds of opportunities bubble up. You, so we talk to a lot of people all the time in the countries that we are trying to work in. It is not episodic. I've been working with Sierra Leone for seven, eight years now, and uh, we have an excellent network from federal ministers to nonprofits to UN agencies, people on the ground. And then we are constantly looking for alignment between some of those expressed or non, not expressed needs and faculty expertise but most importantly, needs for which we believe we can actually design and deliver a sustainable solution along with our partners. And that's where we spend those six to nine months of saying, okay, if we were to develop this muffin uh, with these micronutrients, how do we get it out to the people? If we design a $2 sickle cell diagnostic device, who is part of a coalition to build a system where every single baby born in the country is screened for sickle cell right when they're born, right? We're thinking about those impact pathways. And the students actually, we, that's, they come later. If, if the dream is grand enough, if the dream is compelling enough, the students will come. Yeah. Um, so, so, Yana, do you have a question? And I have, I have another one that follows on that. That's, that's great. Um, I think, please go ahead, Jesse. I think we're coming to okay. time, so I just want to be yeah. mindful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let me just ask one last question. So I think, just to summarize what, what I understood from that, I think what you're talking about is if we have these long-term relationships, we're not identifying a product opportunity or a project or a systemic intervention. What we're doing is saying, okay, let me find partners that are local that have the same engagement philosophy I do, and then with them try and understand the system and identify impact we want to create. Yeah. Yeah, and if I may, I saw a, a, a question here from Glenn McKnight, and he said, how do you avoid the criticism of white failures? And yeah. I'll kind of try to combine these two points, and that is, um, oh, God, I lost my chain of thought. Sorry, Jesse, what was your, uh, oh, my God. Well, what, my, my only point was that I think I was addressing that, that white failures kind of saying, like, if you build these relationships, then you have a team. And yeah, it's a multinational team. Yeah, you have everybody there, but it's not you coming and delivering a technology and leaving. You're trying to create this partnership that then is gonna identify social ventures, possible social ventures that you could create. That was my understanding. Yeah, absolutely. And so those needs and opportunities emerge from the context with local partners, and they are the ones saying, ha, you know, can, you, uh, can we work together on this, right? 
So right. I'll, I'll go back to, you know, philosophically, it was this uh, quote by Gustavo Esteva who said that if you come to help, don't come. But if you see my struggle as your struggle, come and live to, let's live together, and we might find something yeah. to work on. And that's the way we yeah. think about it. So this whole, you know, all these questions about why savior complex is actually moot. You know, when we are working in these places, all the people we work with are incredibly excited to work with us shoulder to shoulder. We're not yeah. white saviors. And for the record, uh, 24 of my 54 students are white. The other 30 are not even white, right? So this is, yeah. we've got to realize that we live in a very different, uh, very different world. And look, we do have different kinds of resources to bring to the table. And if we can, uh, you know, make something happen with those, uh, why not? Yeah. Um, so I just want, I, I, Jana, Jana, you're going you're gonna, to wrap it up. I think that there are, uh, just to answer Glenn's question, there are, uh, for at least several of the projects, I think when he was talking about evaluating impact, uh, audited audits done by independent ones, yeah. That's generally driven by the funding and funders, in my experience. So the funders, like you have to have a relationship with the funder where you say, listen, I think that if you give extra money, you can be assured if that's valuable to you that what we did is actually working and not measured by us, right? And so I know USAID does that a lot um, and, and Gates certainly does that. Uh, it depends on which, which funder type you're working with. And certainly there are types of projects which lend themselves more to that than others and I think uh, uh, Kanjan's work certainly certainly does. Um, Yana, I wanted to pass it off to you. First of all, I wanted to thank Kanjan again. Uh, this is a great vision, and uh, and you gave a lot of practical details to help the rest of us try and learn from that. And I love how you generalize it. Often I see just these lessons from like a very one case study, and I'm trying to understand how does that apply to me. And I think you gave us gave us a lot to work with. So thank you very much for that. Yana, I wanted to pass it off to you to sort of. Uh, wrap it up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jesse. Thank you, Kanja, and I really appreciate you taking the time, and thank you for the good discussion. One thing I would like to note, and um, I know there was a lot of good chatter about, you know, how do we ensure that we are addressing needs and understanding uh, what the context of the communities and, um, you know, that we're serving. Kanjan spoke about that and he kind of glossed over it really quickly because there's so much content there, but he noted that you guys talk about human-centered design techniques as part of your workshop. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with that, um, this is really about unpacking needs and we recently hosted a webinar that I shared the link on the chat about what is human-centered design and how that helps you to also understand the needs before jumping in with some sort of solution. Um, so uh, just for reference, that's included in, in the deck. So uh, again, thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us today. I wanted to give a shout out for our coming presenter in March. We will have Nathan Johnson, who is the assistant professor at Arizona State University speaking. Um, and we encourage all of you to join. There's going to be really great uh, insights on, on his research agenda during that event. Um, again, these, these, the, the nature and the, of the seminars is for discussion, is to learn from each other and, and what we're doing. Um, and uh, we're really excited to hear your thoughts on this. If we didn't cover your questions or you have ideas or you want us to, to give us feedback on the seminar series more generally, we invite you to reach out to us. Uh, the emails are listed there. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for your time today. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Um, wherever you're joining us from today, thank you so much. And uh, let's, let's keep the conversation going. Bye, everyone. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Thanks, Jesse.